Thank you everybody for coming. Um, this is David Hoffmeister. So he's going to be giving us uh, a beautiful talk for the next 45 minutes or so. And just to start us off, we have one of the only books in the world that has its own soundtrack. So we actually have a song called Unwind Your Mind, inspired by the book. And it's uh, sung and played and written by a friend of ours called Pete James, who's actually at our monastery right now, getting ready for the Strawberry Fields Festival. So we'd love to just open tonight with that and just thank you all for coming. When you see yourself as weary Come me and be undone When you see yourself as tired and unkind Come to me and I'll unwind your mind James, he, he planned to be here, but he couldn't be here today to do it live, so that was a beautiful song that he wrote just recently, very recently. Thank you all for coming today. It's really a joy to be here. You know, we've been out in the Salt Lake City area for some time, and it's just really beautiful. It's kind of appropriate that we would <laughs> launch here, right here in Salt Lake City, our, it's kind of like our global book launch, so t this is it. I asked today I asked Sarah, I said, when do we officially launch? She said, today. I said, oh, okay, here we go. <laughs> um, yeah, this book, a lot of times when books come out, uh, 
the author will thank uh, a lot of people that had a lot to do with the book and I could just, if I started going through all the people that are part of this book, it probably, with the 45 minutes, I could just spend 45 minutes um, just naming a lot of names because it's been a culmination of about close to 20 years of collaborations that have gone into this book. And some of you who have seen the book know that it's actually three books in one. It's kind of like a trilogy in one. And there was an enormous amount of collaboration that went into this book because when I started to teach A Course in Miracles in the early 1990s, um, people occasionally would just show up and back in those days put a cassette recorder uh, beside me and record some of the dialogues that I was having with the students as we would meet on a daily basis going deep into the mind and then amazingly some of those uh, cassette tapes made it. They were stored in a, a hot attic and that wasn't the best for them and it was kind of like uh, when they try to restore the Sistine Chapel, you know, uh, restore a piece of art, they were re restoring recordings that were done with not the best of conditions and uh, a lot of those dialogues are in there. So this book actually has dialogues that go back into the 1990s when I was working very closely with students on a day-to-day -day basis. And it was so in-depth that they were kept and archived, you might say, and, and eventually we were able to publish this book. So it's been about 20 years in the making. And the biggest question I get about spiritual awakening and spiritual enlightenment is how? How do I do this? And just like the song that Pete wrote, it's like, you know, you already are what you're looking for, what you're searching for, and you don't have to fix yourself, which is pretty much the mentality of the world, of self-improvement and fixing yourself. It's more just learning to release judgments or let go of faulty thinking, faulty beliefs, faulty perceptions and so to speak, peeling the onion to come back to the core of your essence, which was created by God. So this book is really, if you give yourself over to it, that's really what the book is about. It's about coming back to a remembering of who you are. And I've been getting a lot of comments since the book was first released, since we released some preview copies, and people are saying that the questions are helpful it's question and answer format, and the questions are helpful, but people are saying they're asking questions that I, I had to verbalize, but I had, I had somewhere in me. So it's helping pull the questions out. And part of the journey is asking the right questions, so that you can be shown, or the truth can be revealed to you. So that's a beautiful aspect of this book, is that you can kind of immerse yourself as you work with people, and you, you watch how I work with people, it really makes it very, very clear. Huh. Oh, it's nice. It's a bookstore. <laughs> we come back. So, um, it's really a journey in the mind. Um, when we go inside, none of us were really given an owner's manual, and none of us were really told how to go inside. A lot of us read that in different spiritual traditions that uh, you're supposed to search within for the answers. And so I think this book, in one sense, gives you the how. Just as you're reading, just as you're engaging in it, you actually are experiencing the how. It's, it's kind of it's sneaking in on you uh, without you consciously knowing what's happening, just from your willingness to join and to engage. So, it's been like a labor of love, you might say, and, um, and I feel like uh, it's, it's something, it's very spontaneous, this journey inward, so it's not necessarily a linear progression, but, but basically the book lays it out in terms of what may be most helpful to look at first, kind of laying the foundation and then moving into 
unlearning the world. And then finally, transfer of training, which really just means make no exceptions to the truth, to the principles that you're uncovering in your mind as you go forward. And as you make no exceptions, that's where your peace of mind and your joy and your happiness become more and more consistent. It's only when we make exceptions. You can see that in your own lives. If, if you feel like uh, in many situations um, you can just speak what's right on your heart and say what's right there, but in certain cases like when your parents are around or your children are around or certain people in your lives where you find yourself kind of leaning to please them or to get approval from certain ones that are in your life that seem very important, you can see you might slide and make some exceptions to what seems to be your heart wanting to speak through and shine through. And so this book is, an, is a way to start looking close at these things and not make any exceptions. Regardless of what the encounter is, who you're encountering or who they are in your life, you can start to not make exceptions and that's where you, you grow in the strength of integrity. Because when we make exceptions then th there's a, a form of self-deception that's going on when we're afraid to speak certain things to certain people. And it's the same with emotions, you know, if there's certain emotions that, that you're really not in touch with as you begin to open up your mind and open up your heart, then you do get in touch with some pretty intense emotions. And this book is, in that sense, a gentle guide as well to take you down deeper and deeper and deeper. So, how many here are familiar with A Course in Miracles? Okay, we got a full house. <laughs> So many of you who've worked with the Course know that at times it can be, seem challenging and so forth. That's, you might say in one sense this book is like a companion to A Course in Miracles. It quotes the Course very frequently, but it's designed to give lots of, of examples, of metaphors, parables, things that, that bring the principles to life so that you can apply them more readily and more consistently in your daily life. And that really is, is what the Course is about. It's actually aiming at an experience, it's aiming at a state of mind. It's not just another book to learn or another theology to memorize. It actually has a, a workbook, as you know, for practical application. So in, that, in this sense, again, the book is designed to be a companion for that as well. Also, as you go deeper and deeper, you learn that nothing really is personal and it takes a lot of unlearning or unwinding to come into that experience that nothing is personal. Because the ego takes everything in a very personal way. That's where the emotions come in, that's where the charges come in. And so this book is named Unwind Your Mind and it might have received its title from the the metaphors that I've used over the years of, of kind of like as if you had a, um, as if your mind was like a screw drilled into a, a board of oak and it's in there very tight and you can't pull it out like you would put a, pull a nail out. You literally have to turn the screw, you have to take the turns and the turns and the turns to get that screw out of that hard piece of wood. And that's a metaphor I've used and, and it's come through a number of different ways and that's just one that's been like a recurring metaphor that I found very helpful because that's how it seemed in my life that I had to go at this. I had to be very persistent. I had to continue on even in the face of doubts and fears of wanting to just give up, turn away, you know, distract away and so forth to keep the persistence there to go and keep doing the work, doing the work, applying the lessons, applying the lessons. So, uh, some people say crank it up, we're like cranking it out. <laughs> you just keep at it and keep it turning, turning, turning. It does also seem to be an experience that the more you have loosened your mind, the more reflections you see of that. And I, I would say over the years I find that there's a quickening going on, a huge 
acceleration. It's like the awakening seems to be occurring at more of a, what the world would see as like an exponential rate. We're meeting people, we're coming together, we're joining together more, and it seems like the, the laughter and the, the happiness seems to be bursting through, like sunshine bursting through the clouds at a much faster rate. And it really is an, uh, like a demonstration that when, when we're healed, we're not healed alone. We, as we accelerate our healing process in the mind, we draw forth more and more witnesses to that. And for me, that's taken the form of actually living in communities, spiritual communities, and traveling around the world, because I meet so many people that are reflecting back this healing in mind, this happiness and this joy, the gratitude. I just get emails every day of, of immense gratitude. A psychiatrist just wrote to me today, just before I came down, so I put it on our Yahoo Global mailing list, but it was just a, a, a letter of deep gratitude uh, where he had just begun with uh, the first chapter of the book, and he was just reading something on form and content, and he had a major flash, a major insight uh, that he was just so grateful for, so he had to just spill out his gratitude in an email. Those are the kind of witnesses that as we go through the healing, we experience the witnesses all around us of healing. And that's really, you might say, that's kind of like your barometer. Even though you don't really need to try to figure out where you are on the healing journey, uh, but you can start to feel the witnesses, the reflections that you draw into your life. The healed relationships that you experience are all part of that awakening. It just comes more and more, waves and waves of those witnesses and those examples. So I've been really blessed to have that experience of those waves of gratitude. And I just feel like it's, I, I haven't tried to actually write a book. Uh, this book kind of came of itself with all these collaborations. I didn't set out to write the book. Uh, since we're all Course in Miracles students are very familiar with it, you know that basically the Course is teaching that that uh, God is the author of reality. And that's a beautiful lesson. That's the only lesson we have to learn is that God is the author of reality. To go along with that, it's basically saying that there aren't any other authors. So if I, if I seem to sign a book today, it's you can say who signed it. It's, just say, God is the author of reality. Because <laughs> it's very humbling to start to see that you aren't the author of your own life. And I know uh, sometimes A Course in Miracles gets put in the New Age section of bookstores. But a lot of times the New Age can teach, create your own reality. And the Course is actually teaching reality was created for you by God. And you can accept your own reality but you aren't the creator of reality. And, and also that you are not the author of your life. That, that God authored you in spirit, God authored you in truth, and the most you can do when you forgive is accept yourself as God created you. So that's a little bit different teaching than, you know, create your own reality, which can get more into manifesting and make a better you. Try a different you. Try a different you on. And uh, someone from California, a friend of mine, Patrick, just wrote, uh, he wrote in a review of this book, he said, uh, what makes you think that you, as you know yourself in this world, is a good judge of what's better? Uh, because the personality self is, is part of the mask that was made to cover over our spiritual reality. So he was bringing up that point of, when you talk about creating the world you want or the life that you want, it kind of implies that, that a person would know that. And really this is the exact opposite. This is more surrendering to the spirit in you, your intuitive self, which can lead you back to an experience of, of your actual self, your spiritual reality. So, even though I've showed up here to give a talk, I, you know from a lot of my gatherings on YouTube and Spreaker and all over the internet that I enjoy interactions and I would be happy to uh, answer any questions about the book or my life or 
anything that's on your heart, really, because that is the most important thing for me. These are always very spontaneous <coughs> gatherings at coming together to join in an experience. And the book is a good springboard for that. And I'm happy to open up the floor to everyone now, if anyone has anything to ask or share. but love and so am I. Yeah, you're describing the, this devotional reverent life where you just give your mind over to God. You give yourself over to the heart of God and you see that you have your life and your existence, your being in God. And that would be an example of bringing the illusions to the truth and just emptying the altar, saying, no, I wouldn't put anything else on that altar but you, God. Putting God first. There was a, a I don't know if you remember that movie with, uh, the, about the life of uh, Gail Sayers, a, a Chicago running back years ago, but I think he came out with a book um, God is first, my family is second, and I am third. And yet when we get into the blessings of these deep teachings, we start to realize that our true will and the will of God are actually the same. So even some of those really famous prayers by saints and mystics, not my will, but thy will be done, there comes a point of, of humble recognition of acceptance, of, of accepting yourself as God created you, where you can say, my will and thy will are one. And that's the most humble experience that there could ever be. It, it actually would be arrogant to try to think that you could make yourself different than God created you. So, the book really helps with the mind training of starting to realize that Everything is, a, is an idea, and that ideas leave not their source, and just like Christ could never leave the mind of God, the ideas and everything we perceive in this world, as much as it may seem to be out there, isn't really out there. That the, the way the healing occurs is this integration of seeing that every, anything that you're bothered by, anything that you're disturbed by, frustrated by, it's because you're still trying to see it outside of your mind. And the Spirit is gently using this book, and as far as the unwinding, to bring it back to see that you have empowerment. You actually, your mind contains all the thoughts. And therefore this idea of projection is an attempt to get rid of something you don't want. And eventually you, you realize that you want God, and you would see nothing outside. Welcome. You're sparkling, Mike. You're smiling so big, it's like you've been here for the whole... Like she didn't even have to be here for the first 20 <laughs> minutes. Just walks in, grinning from ear to ear. <laughs> That's right. That's what we mean by drawing witnesses. I'm like, oh, there's a sparkler back there. It's just walked in. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. You feel the love. Josh. I wonder, perhaps I might be overthinking that she could be a problem. <laughs> On the, I mean, up, since starting the course, I've kind of struggled with the idea of I need do nothing as it applies to like, just like daily activities like work children and you know like 
I get a little anxious and I think I need to do nothing. I don't, I want to believe it, but then I have trouble applying, like, you know, to get rid of anxiety about the thoughts of me to do this and that. Yeah. Well, we could look at what seems to be doing seems to involve decisions and decisions we could say are continuous but but the mind is not really aware of all the decisions that it's made. There's a lot of decisions that are turned into beliefs. They're unconscious decisions. They're they they become almost like we could say solidified as beliefs and they're assumed to be true. So like for example with sickness you know, who in their right mind would choose to be sick, who in full awareness and f open full consciousness would choose sickness, they wouldn't. But if there's unconscious beliefs that involve a lot of guilt and shame and darkness, then it seems like the body uh, has symptoms or there's an experience of discomfort and, and being ill at ease and dis-ease. It's the same with the idea of I need to do nothing in the sense that that if you have unconscious beliefs that you are a body in this world and you have lacks and you have needs, um, the best part of the Course is, is that Jesus says instead of doing a top-down approach, just kind of waving the magic spiritual wand and everything just disappears, it's a bottom-up approach. And so you can't really receive answers beyond that which you are capable of understanding. So you don't have to try to beat yourself up with, with an idea from the Course, like, wow, that sounds, sentimentally, I'm with you there, but practically it doesn't seem like it's going to work at all. It, it seems like it would create more of a tension, um, like if you stayed home, we'll say, say and you just went, okay, I need to do nothing so I need not work, I need not uh, fulfill responsibilities and duties and so on and so forth, there could be a tension. Just like if uh, you were employed and you signed an employment contract to fulfill certain duties and responsibilities and then you decided to go with the I need to do nothing uh, solution that there could be a dissonance, there could be a friction between the reflections of the boss and you. If you said you were going to do something, you didn't do it. So that's why the book, Unwind Your Mind, Back to God, is really having you take a close look at your beliefs and your thoughts, because what you do comes from what you think. And as long as your mind is still will say, trapped or addicted into ego thinking, the doing will seem to come automatically from those thoughts. People don't often have to consciously think every single day, why am I getting up, getting out of bed, brushing my teeth, and going to work and doing these things because there are needs that they perceive that seem to have to be met in some way. And though some of us, I had long talks with Jesus about, you know, money doesn't grow on trees, and I was, you know, having, telling him, you know, this is the way it works here, and he was saying, yes, you do believe that, and I will work with your beliefs. So, ultimately, I would say, I need to do nothing is, it is an ultimate truth, in a sense that you merge your mind so much with the Holy Spirit or with the will of God and you merge and, and have such an experience of beingness that the needs are gone. You literally transcend your needs from the bottom up through miracles in a, in a very systematic and practical way. It's not, you know, just getting a beam of light hitting you or, or something. It's, it's actually releasing false ideas, false concepts and beliefs, and then having an experience where you can have your mind rest in a state of such deep stillness that there are no needs, there are no desires, there are no ambitions, and you are one with God. But you, I would say instead of 
using I need do nothing in a, in a way that seems conflictual to you. It's just more just ask yourself honestly with everything that you seem to feel to do, what is it for? And just by asking what is it for with, with your, the jobs and the different things that you do, you do unwind, you do start to loosen and you open your mind to a new purpose. You open your mind greater and wider to, to forgiveness. And in that sense it's very, very practical. The more spontaneous you become, the more tuned in and aligned, you know, you, your motives, your heart becomes pure and therefore the actions just flow from that pure heart and you disidentify from being the doer. And in the end, you know, your awareness is literally beyond the body and beyond any sense of doing. For an example, like when I come to give a talk or have these kind of gatherings, my mind is very still and actually very blank, so I'm not like making mental notes of like highlights or topics or what I will talk about. It's just being in the prayer of uh, Spirit, give me the words, bless the people, bless myself, bless everyone with your presence. It's like, it's a prayer, but there's no conscious selecting of words, or selecting of topics even. And yet I'm still practical. If I'm asked to speak at a conference, and they send me an email, and they say, we need a topic. Listen, <laughs> we're, we're putting out flyers, <laughs> we're doing the whole thing, we need a topic, then I give a topic. I don't always speak completely on that topic, although it's all connected, but I just show up and let it come through, and that's just an example of not having a sense of doership with it, not having the pressure of that. And not like trying to decide an outcome or how it should go. Yeah. Yeah, Frances and I did a television show this morning. Some of you have heard her TV show out of the blue comes Francis Zhu, and we talked about that, that, in the, that we're taught go within, experience the truth within, and the kingdom of heaven is within, and heaven doesn't have an outcome. Heaven doesn't come out. You know, it doesn't concern itself with the world of form, with morality and ethics. A lot of the things that seem very, very practical and important, you know, in the world are given over to the Spirit, but it's more like you come inside to the truth. You don't try to find it in the forms and the images. So yeah, when you mentioned outcome, that's exactly what we talked about on the show today, that there's, there's no need to come out. There's no need to give your mind and attention to distractions, idols, images, judgments, comparisons. You can sink inside and drop beneath them all. Or 
Um, <coughs> what would you have to say about this? I, I have um, some people coming, you know, that really the only healing you need is your the healing of your mind. You know? I have a hard time believing it. So, I don't know, um, can you comment? Yeah, I think that's, that's just like a perennial idea that free your mind and the body will follow, um, is free your mind from the, the beliefs of the ego, the pursuits of the ego, the distractions of the ego, and the body will follow that unified purpose. <coughs> and then you'll feel a sense of completion and a sense of harmony and a sense of wholeness. And that's where the peace is, is, is in that. And it's very helpful in the Course and also in this book, it's just telling you specifically that the, the body is, is meant to be a communication device. And it's important that you start to more give it over for that purpose, instead of uh, using it for all the other purposes that the ego may have for it. Because when you use it for communication, increasingly it, you approach communion. So there's communication and then communion, which is communion with God. And that we could call revelation. But you can't prepare your mind for revelation without miracles, otherwise it would be too traumatic to be, have the world disappear in flesh and to have everything disappear and be gone. So you practice letting it be used as a communication device. So it's more of a, so if I've got a body problem, I can think of it as um, sort of, it's a challenge, it's a, it's a challenge, but it's something there to speak to me, kind of. Um, so I can question, you know, like what, you know, so I can question. Yeah, it's like a nudge. It's it's a call back into your function. Yeah. Sickness is function unfulfilled. Ill, being ill at ease or being uncomfortable is just function unfulfilled. And then as you open up to function and you become more and more aligned with your purpose, with your function, which again is communication, then you complete that communication function and that returns you to communion which really the mind never left, but in awareness it was pushed out of awareness. So that's the way it's been. I mean, the, the parable of David's kind of been documented. You can go back and look at early YouTubes when there was hair or beards or things and me going around wearing the same peach-colored sweatshirt or whatever that people would say, do you know, do you have any other color? Uh, you know, back in the early days, just going around, I wasn't really thinking about wardrobe or anything. I was just <laughs> happy to be going around shining. But it, it was just getting into my function of communication, which was no small thing for me because I, I was, David was very shy. There was, there was, you know, a sense of uh, of being very inhibited in many ways. So. So I needed a function of communication to kind of open up my heart, open up my mind, and, and become aligned with the Spirit. So that was very important. So the next time that you experience a problem with the body, that, that would be a good reminder just to tell yourself, ah, this is calling me back into my function. Instead of jumping right away with the future scenarios, or you know, how yeah. how will I deal with this? Well, one thing I'm I'm told is that you can be in pain and suffer, or you can just be in pain. Um, yeah. So I can ha have pain and have judgments about it, or maybe even as I'm slowly letting those judgments go, and some of the the body that I'm so concerned about here, maybe some of those problems will start to go away. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Even as something as, as simple as what seems to be fatigue, the more 
inspired you are, the more in function, you know, the, you find that the vitality comes from purpose, not from, from sleep or from rest. So that's a common tired, cure it with rest, and this is tired, cure it with purpose, <laughs> cure it with function. You see how different that is. Yeah. Maybe there's something else going on too that I'm not suspecting something something in the mind. Yeah. Yeah, okay. Alright, I appreciate that answer. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Zipping by very quick. <laughs> it's one of our shortest gatherings on record. <laughs> I like that you were saying, saying the question, what is it for? And I remember because the other day I was actually watching you online and you are talking about money and you were on a walk with Jesus and you were asking Jesus why you need money. And Jesus put you through a series of questions. Mm -hmm. And then ultimately I, I remember that you said that at home. The reason you felt like he needed the money was because he felt like he needed it for a relationship. Mm -hmm. So I like that um, you mentioned that because um, you know, cause I, if I think I've got these needs or body needs, maybe there is something else behind it that it's not quite what I think. Of. So there's something there that's it's asking me to, I guess it's asking for perception yeah it does relate to Josh's question about about doing things and and the I need to do nothing because as long as there's a sense of lack and a sense of need then it seems very practical in the linear world to meet those needs and that's what the human condition seems to be it seems to be meeting needs and then they occur again and then you meet them again and the idea of of efforting and working and striving seems very very real because the needs seem real yeah. and the striving seems real and because the needs recur if they just stopped yeah, you know that's true. you said oh, I had my and my last meal yeah. and that's it I'm not going to eat again mm -hmm. because I I've I've completely transcended hunger you see that, I would say, you need the Spirit for that, where, you know, Jesus said to the woman at the well, drink of me, and you will never thirst again. And that was, I think, a call to vertical perception, align with your Christ self, align with God, and you will never want for anything again, you will never thirst again, so forth. So that really fits in with what we were talking about with, with Josh. Yeah. You don't try to skip over anything, you don't try to negate the body and yeah. say, well, I'm spirit, so I'm not going to do anything anymore. Yeah. In all my travels to course groups around the world, I've heard some amazing stories of Course in Miracles students. One student just, I think he stayed in his bed for maybe a week or ten days or something, but it was a mess, defecating and urinating. That was his version of, I need do nothing. I need not leave my bed. Uh, he literally, he tried to take it literally of, of not moving the body and, and just stayed in bed. Uh, but that's the thing with anything, if you, if you try to apply it at the form level without looking at the beliefs and the emotions and the thoughts, then, you know, talk about putting the, the cart before the horse, you know, you've really spun it around. I actually had one woman in Wisconsin one time who met me, came all the way up from Florida, and she was, said she was really good at hypnotherapy, she was like a master hypnotherapist, and so she tried, decided to hypnotize herself. And I said, well, what did you use? And she said, I used part of a workbook lesson, um, I am not a body. The one that says, I am not a body, I am free, I am still as God created me. She just hypnotized herself with, I am not a body. And then she found herself like running into glass and she, she was pushing the body out of awareness. But she, she would try to walk through glass doors and she kept feeling the bruises on the body <laughs> and the bumps and the bruises. But, but she actually hypnotized herself so much that she was pushing the body out of awareness using hypnosis. 
really not, the Course is not advocating that at all. It's like working with the effect, using the mind to work with one effect and, and not going for forgiveness. Eventually, um, she said, I think, I think I was missing something. And I said, well, yeah, it's not, the Course doesn't really advocate you hypnotize yourself that you're not a body. It, she carried it out so far that one day she went into the bathroom and she looked in the mirror and guess what was gone? The body. She couldn't, she couldn't even see the reflection in the mirror. She had put so much effort into, I am not a body. But that's not what we're advocating. We're advocating a shift of purpose in the mind for the body and all the world. And then you see the world differently and then what seems to be formed just flows from that spiritual guidance. Yeah. But it's not about trying to deny the body or certainly uh, push it out of awareness. We're just trying to loosen our hold. Yeah, on the use of the body, the ego's use of the body. Yeah. Yeah, because um, I wouldn't have even thought that about healing my mind, I would have just, you know, um, what can I do physically, you know, this and that. And really, I could cover over problems, but I can't really fix it. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it. It's helpful. Thank you. Okay. We're we're winding down here. Anybody else have any questions or comments? Can you speak a little bit about um, love relationships and, and uh, you know our societal need to find a partner and and how the course talks about our mind and child relationship really should be with God and you know how we feel I need to have a hand with in our lives. Yeah. Yes. And we're welcome. We're welcome. Okay, we can we can continue on. Yeah, I think it's it's what I was talking about on the show today, um, that idea that as you go deeper inside and you come to a sense of integrity and you come to a sense of purpose and wholeness and completion, then what seems to be outcomes, which are form uh, outcomes, start to fade and fade in your awareness. So the desire, you know, the Bible said the kingdom of heaven is within and that's what it says in the Course. Um, seek not outside yourself, for it will fail and you will weep each time an idol falls. So when you cling to a concept of the self that involves what we'll call externals, again that's the belief in an external world and the body even, even being external, when really it's all in mind, but when you pursue that then it does seem to be that that's how it happens. It's You travel along gaily for a while and then the rug gets pulled. Uh, or there's some kind of outcome that's judged as, as negative, harsh, a sense of loss, a sense of abandonment. And yet the mind comes back around and, you know, as Carly Simon says, if you're willing to play the game it will be coming around again. It just seems to circulate over and over and over as long as you're seeking for it. And, and the turnaround towards holy relationship is if you start to see everything as thoughts and reflections of thoughts that you use relationships as mirrors and you pay close attention to your feelings. And when you're not feeling happy and joyful and free and alive then you, that you can notice the tendency is going to be to try to see something wrong in the world. And so it can go from seeming to be a blessing, like thank you friend, partner, for, for helping me see what I need to heal, to projection or blame. And then, you know, that gets into seeking perhaps other partners, looking for satisfaction in many other different ways, and really getting away from the, the gift 
that's offered because it's a huge gift so I think it has to be a shift of purpose again for what's the relationship for that's what's going to to provide the healing it's not looking for form outcomes and a lot of times people talk about for example like the dating scene is it's very scientific in terms of looking in terms of compatibilities um, almost like interviewing candidates I mean a lot of times when people have what seems to be upward mobility they'd be very successful in the world they don't have a lot of time on their hands because they work so much but they have a little sliver of time and so it's like they kind of go in and will hire a service kind of research and development in terms of that and it's no different than maybe going to a grocery store and shopping for the best fruits and the best meats and the best candy and so forth you know trying to maximize your value you know it's much more seen then as not as a reflection but more as a commodity and then you know that's the way that everything is viewed in this world in terms of products commodity um, it it just it's depressing actually when you follow that out and you actually try to uh, maximize your personality <laughs> by by getting the best uh, uh, in all ways including relationships then it's it's very much I call it like that's like Dixie cup relationships you ever remember those Dixie cups where you take the little paper cups and you just take take one out and you take a drink and then you throw it away and you take the next one you get a drink and you throw it away that's very much what dating can turn into um, it's like Dixie cup relationships now of course that was back in the old days nowadays they have these speed dating where you actually can go into a room and you get like five or ten minutes and then you, then you have to switch and switch and switch so it's it's actually uh, it's designed to be Dixie cups <laughs> and you're supposed to get in as many Dixie cups as you can in, a, in, a, in an evening or something so you know it starts to you know you see the contrast there my experience is that I cannot really see myself and so it, it's only through my relationship with others that I am shown you know who I am mm -hmm. and also it's really to use a slightly different lexicon uh, being in a relationship with someone else is a, is a way to, for me to identify or be the grandest version of the greatest vision of who I can be so I, I, I embrace relationships I think they're wonderful we're all in relationships, so this is a relationship right here now. Mm -hmm. Yeah, once we start to see it from kind of a holistic or a quantum view that that this is a relationship, you know, this is the way it looks right now. This is the way we ask it to be, you know, to tell us, to inform us. And when we open our minds up, we're, we're receptive, we're paying close attention to everything. We want to be fully aware. We want to take it all in, drink it all in. And I was saying that um, whereas the spiritual journey from the ego's perspective, it's like, what have I got to give up now? Give up, give up, give up, give up. Let go, let go, release, release, release. From the higher perspective with the Holy Spirit, it's just everything is, is integrating. It, everything is, is, is our mind, is our consciousness. And we can be all encompassing that way. We, we don't have to turn our heads or push anything away or try to ignore something or try to distract away from something. We can be totally embracing of everything that's in our consciousness. And when we have total embrace, then we have peace. When we want to push something away and say, that's not me, you know. I mean, some of the stuff even, I've heard it over the centuries, you know, uh, one of the things I used to hear was somebody say, but for the grace of God, there go I. And you could almost say when you get into this integrating, it's because of the grace of God, there go I. You see it just turns the whole meaning around from this idea that, that persons can be saved, that somehow there's a saving grace for one and not another, which is really not how it works at all. As long as there's one prisoner that walks the world in chains and you know your mind 
is in chains. And as soon as you've set all the captives free, then you have freed yourself and freed the whole world. At that point, I can tell you, you won't be concerned about what people believe because people don't believe anything. People are beliefs. And whatever the past that you still have unresolved that you don't want to look at, they're going to do you a favor and act it out so that you can tell exactly what you need to heal. <laughs> and that's why they show up. Law of attraction. Yeah. Some of you might have seen uh, George Clooney's uh, movie Solaris. At our community they're, sh they're showing, they've got a, the movie Solaris with all my commentary and they made it halfway through. Now, I think Friday's the other half. But actually, Rhea, his, who plays his wife, uh, comes back to him on this near this planet of Solaris and she is not whole. She's just basically acting out everything that he still sees in her in the past. He still has unresolved issues around her suicide, so she comes back. You know, Solaris represents, you know, the the mind, what you give, you receive, what you sow, so you reap. So he still has that unresolved, so she comes back and he shoots her out and sends her away again and she comes back again because it's unresolved. And that's the way it happens with relationships. We should always have full appreciation and gratitude for the relationships because they're, they're doing us a great service in mind. In fact, it, it would be difficult if not impossible to forgive, to raise into awareness an unconscious belief system and forgive it without some mechanism of showing you what's going on. Otherwise you could just you know, be like the ostrich and have the head buried in the sand for a millennium. Just pretending things are okay when you know, it's really not comfortable at all. Yeah. So thank you for that. How do you feel about Well, it's not really essential to the curriculum, but I think it's a belief system that the Spirit can use as long as it sends you in the direction of eternal life, as long as it is used in a helpful way of seeing that, that love is all-inclusive and no one can ever be turned away from that love, or, or choose apart from that love, then I think it has benefits, kind of over the heaven and hell, you know, the ones that go to heaven and the ones that burn in the fire. It has advances, but ultimately it involves time. And the Course is really designed to take you into the holy instant, and have you even question your beliefs in time, the beliefs that you could incarnate not many times, but even once, you know, that Strictly speaking, even when the Bible says the Word was made flesh, Jesus says in the Course, strictly speaking, that's impossible because you can't take something that's Spirit, the Word of God, capital W, and make it into something that's finite and limited. And so ultimately that's another belief that gets undone. Yeah, It's an explanation. It's an ex explanation for the impossible. And in the end, you, you do give up all explanations of the impossible and you just accept the truth and that, that brings you out of the impossible. So do you think that when we die, when we lose our body, that, that, uh, never reached through death, but it's more like um, instead of leaving the realm and leaving the world, it's more like the mind, as long as it's invested in the ego, it's got like its remote control and it keeps changing the TV channel and just keeps changing the channel over and over and over until it realizes that this is pointless, that it's not going to resolve it in form. So it's a little bit different than the idea that you know how they have on, on sometimes on gravestones, rip, <laughs> rest in peace. It's like, but peace is not reached, reached through death. It's reached through forgiveness and resurrection. So, yeah, so you could. In that sense, you could think, um,
you know, or chase channel and and uh, go seem to go at it. That, that's uh, I think it's lesson one thirty two goes into that. Um, it's talking about um, there is no world in, in that there is no world apart from what you think, and 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 there are those who come again. He says, "Well, come again." You, know, you could interpret that in a reincarnational perspective, or just uh, trying to choose something that that is really not really a a viable choice, but you know, some of you remember the Matrix trilogy, and um, it was the end of the second Matrix film where uh, Neo goes and he meets the architect, and basically the, ar- the architect says, the door to your right leads to the source, and the door to your left leads back to Trinity in the Matrix, and he does not give it some prayer and consideration. Um, we talk about relationships. He goes immediately. I'll take door number two. Uh, he wants Trinity. He wants to go back and try to save Trinity, and then he finds himself unconscious. That's that's how the second one ends. He makes his choice to not go for the source, to go back to Trinity in the Matrix, and then he finds himself unconscious when the Sentinels come and get him. So that right there is a teaching, you know, just in itself. Yeah. All this has been helpful for some reason. Like in the past couple of weeks, I've been studying pretty heavily and watching YouTube videos and stuff on like astral projection and stuff. And you know how you mentioned uh, what is it for? Just I've been sitting here thinking, I, for me at least, as an ego, I just realized it might I might be I have unsuccessfully haven't been able to leave the body and go on a vacation yet. Because um, that's what I see as. And then I just realized, you know, um, thinking of changing the channel too. I might just be trying to escape and change the channel. Like, well, astral projection sounds really awesome. I wondered if there's benefits to it, if you've thought about it at all. But in a way, it frees you of a body. But maybe, at least for me, in the wrong way, it seems like now, <laughs> to try to get away from worries and stuff. Sense. Every night when you sleep, you actually you ask for the check. That's what you say. I just want to remember it. One control. Yeah, one control. Yeah. Control. Yeah. Yeah. Control. yeah, it could be uh, my friend here in the front was, was hit by a truck and basically had an a near-death experience, an out-of-body experience, and that that out-of-body experience, you were just telling me right before our talk tonight, how amazing that was to, to view the body from outside the body. Yeah, and, and it, I've had a lot of people that have come to me over the years where they have their first out-of-body experience or near-death experience. I call them near-life experiences because they Talk about going into the light. I said, you had a near-life experience. Uh, flip it around. Uh, f- because this is assumed to be life, biological life, and it's really all inverted backwards and upside down. But, but it was a powerful experience because, you know, it, it's an experience of, gee, I'm not viewing the body through the body. I'm viewing the body outside the body. And, and just that, just that one experience can be a loosening of the belief that you're a body. It's actually a reflection of, of a miracle um, that you're not the body. Now, it's the same, some people have it when they have a drug experience. They may have take some form of drug and have a very expansive experience. The problem is, is, the, is the, cause, the cause and effect of believing that the drug caused this expansive experience and then before you know it they have a drug addiction. You know, they will come back to that drug and will attempt over and over and over to repeat that expansive experience when really in mind they were just ready for an expansive experience. The drug was just a part of the perception. It didn't cause anything at all. And, you know, we, we could say, yeah, it's, it's like we're not saying, advocating go out and get hit by a truck and at mm-hmm. all, but we're saying that you can have an experience that is a very powerful symbol that you are more 
than the body. And that's good. That's, that's what meditation is for. That's what practicing the workbook of A Course in Miracles is for. And you need those symbols along the way, otherwise it would be too terrifying. So it's almost like taking it piece by piece in something that's, that can be appreciated and, and it's gentle, not you know, so dramatic that you feel uh, violated. You know, because the, the mind when it's addicted to form, it needs to gently kind of open up like a flower, you know, to the spirit. So to realize you're not a body is a good thing, but just without the need to get rid of the body, because that's actually giving more validity. Well, yes. Saying that there's something there that I'm supposed to see past or that's it. It's, it. If there's anything, if you're coming at it from a perspective of trying to get rid of the body or get rid of the world, um, you're subconsciously making it real. Yeah, saying there is something there. Yeah. I'd say that's what I've been doing, though. <laughs> trying to find a vacation and stuff. But, you know, it would also be helpful, like you say, that a miracle Yeah, you could just think of it as, instead of trying to take a vacation from the body, uh, as you get into your function, miracle working function, you're, every time you choose the miracle, every time you say, Spirit, perform a miracle through me, um, you are taking a vacation from the ego. Because that's what the miracle this is. is. What I'm really seeking. Yes, that's what you want. And that's why the, the astral projection I mean, I would just say, uh, instead of trying to push hard for something like that, a vacation from the body, you know, there's lots of great movies. We, somebody just mentioned this movie, Eden. There's a movie that was made called Eden that you might want to watch. It's a housewife who basically, is, she spends most of the movie astral projecting, remote viewing, doing all these things, and then ultimately coming Back, becoming quite fascinated with all the realms and the things that she's exploring and st starting to come back to the question about what's it all for? You know, and that's really, it's the same with psychic abilities. You really have to be honest and ask what, what is this for? Because the ego can use psychic abilities just as easy as the spirit. And the ego will use them to keep you trapped. I, sometimes I use the, remember the, what was it, years ago, call in, the Dionne Warwick psychic hotline, oh, yeah. <laughs> you know. Well, of course, if you have a psychic ability, the ego's first thing will be, I can make some good money off of this. <laughs> you notice how it's got a one-track mind. It's, it's always looking for gain, material gain, or some kind of gain of skills and ability, personal gain. It, that's its, its one-track mind. So it will take a psychic ability and it will try to turn that into a profit. And then oftentimes you actually will lose, you can even lose the ability because you've misused it, you know, for the ego and then the, the ability seems to fade away. Yeah. Yeah. Yes? What were you referring to when you said the mirror cannot become flesh? Well, it's, it's referring initially to the Bible, um, the, the Word became flesh, the Word, capital W, became flesh, and Jesus is commenting on the Bible, actually, by saying, strictly speaking, you can't translate one realm into another. So, Word of God... Um, All of the material that is an illusion, which is based on consciousness, which is... Yeah, I think, I, I remember oftentimes asking myself, what is the Word of God? That was a question I had. And at one point in the workbook, Jesus says, the Word of God is, I am as God created me. Um, so it's really speaking of the Christ nature, the pure Christ nature. And it seems like 2,000 years ago, the Word became flesh. But strictly speaking, he's saying, you you can't ever translate spirit into perception. You might say that as you give perception over to spirit, 
and it becomes in alignment with the Spirit's purpose, then you have a true perception or a happy dream or a forgiven world is what he's aiming at. But, but ultimately, um, what is eternal and what is time? Um, eternity and time d don't coexist. One is real and one isn't, and that's really what he's, he's pointing at with that teaching. I've asked a lot of questions, but um, it goes back to something you said earlier, which you said, uh, you mentioned the word resurrection. And since I was a child, I was taught that resurrection, or your salvation, is actually that you will have the body again. And so completely opposite of kind of what the Course is saying. So from a Course, or um, from your point of view, what is resurrection? It's just healing in mind. It's it's the mind that was upside down with upside down thinking coming right side up, oh. and so it's like turning the tables on the ego, where you eventually accept atonement or you accept the the miracle, and you see that you are not at the mercy of the world. The world is it had never left your mind. You are one with everything. That's what the quantum physics call, you know, quantum physicists call the unified field, where everything's totally connected. And that's, that's also an example of resurrected mind. But it's, it's not a body, and of course we, we grew up with the Jesus story where the stone got rolled away, you know, he goes in, yeah. he comes out, and he's got a, a resurrected body, and he goes around and he speaks, and so on and so forth. But that's like a symbol and uh, there have been teachers who have talked about this, I've talked about it quite a bit, was actually when you look at it in terms of mind and consciousness, that you could say the resurrection occurred before the crucifixion. And people will say, wait a minute, you got the story backwards. No, crucifixion, resurrection. But, but when Jesus was baptized by John, and he was in the River Jordan, in the way the script was playing out, so to speak, and the dove came down and landed on Jesus' head, and then the voice from the heavens spoke and said, This is my beloved Son, in whom I'm well pleased. You notice, from that point on, that it doesn't sound like a man speaking anymore. I and the Father are one, before Abraham was, I am. You know, it's like, whoa, something happened there. There is some kind of a resurrection or something. There's, there's a healing that occurred. And then he started calling apostles. You see, after that, you could say literally the, the resurrection of the mind came before the crucifixion scene. So, you know, by the time the crucifixion came around, there was no pain, there was no suffering. It was just teach only love. You, you see how that flips the whole story around. So for those of us who were raised Christians and studied the Bible, you know, that's a, it can seem like a mind bender. Yeah. But actually it's a, it's a mind clarifier, because yeah. it, it makes sense that, that the Spirit could heal the sick, raise the dead, and demonstrate that, that Spirit is all-powerful and the body is nothing. And also Jesus demonstrated really that, that money was nothing. I mean, there was that one story about paying the temple taxes and getting coin out of the mouth of a fish, but basically we don't read in the Gospels of Jesus pulling out his wallet and talking about, hey, hey Peter, look at all, the, look at what I've got, you know, he's just, you don't even hear any stories of him even carrying money. And when he's teaching and teaching for hours and hours, the apostles get concerned that, Lord, you, you haven't eaten. And he says, I have manna that comes from above. It's, it's the spirit, you know, it's just, it's an apparition that's being used. The body is like a, just a symbol being used to teach the kingdom of heaven. Basically, that's it. And even when the crucifixion comes, why the apostles had so much trouble was because of their own upside-down perception. They thought, this guy's still the man. And when they saw what happened with the crucifixion, through their upside-down perception, they thought, that's got to hurt. It's a lot of blood, and that, that's got to hurt. And then when Jesus reappears, he appears not to the apostles, but Mary Magdala. Because she was really the one that she had the eyes to see. She was ready to see. She was paying attention to what he was actually talking about. 
The guys weren't. <laughs> but the girl goes, hey, I, saw, I have seen the Lord. And they go, she's crazy. So, you know, so much for apostles. <laughs> you know, it's like, it really comes down to how, how willing are you to see with a new perception, not, you know, the form of things. Yeah. yeah. I would like to add one thing. I, I much prefer at one to atonement because I think that really nails nails it right on the head. That the real truth is that we are all one. We are simply manifestations and aspects of God, and it's only our belief that we are separate from God that we feel we're led to suffering. So I, I again, I just I just love the concept, the, the term at one. Yeah, I think from Course perspective, atonement is correction, so we're here to experience the correction so that we can experience the, one, the oneness. So, in one sense, atonement leads to at one And uh, that's the goal, is, is to forgive, accept the correction, yeah. That's good. I really want to thank you for this holy moment. Yeah, I, I want to thank you all for coming. Mm -hmm. And um, we have books here. Some of you may have already had them. I heard uh, early on that Charles had had bought some for Doug Roy's group, mm -hmm. and I've already autographed one of those. <laughs> I said, that's the first time in my life where I said, who do I make it out to? Doug Roy's group. <laughs> that's the first <laughs> time I was like, okay. So that was it. That was beautiful. But Charles is with us in spirit. Mm -hmm. His beautiful, shining spirit, you know, has been with us. I guess somebody said, is he living in, back in Texas now? San Antonio. San Antonio. Back to San Antonio. Thank you, dude. Thank you. Beautiful. Yeah, thank you everyone for coming. And um, we have some resources here if, you, if anyone would like to have a look at them and, and just let you know about Strawberry Fields Forever that's coming up. And Salida is here, uh, if any of you are locals and, and felt to come. So please feel free to come and have a look. And if, if anyone still doesn't have a book, they can be purchased at the register. And yeah, I think David's happy. If you, if you would like a little love note, that's no problem. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you all very, very much. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. Yes. Um, I'm Karen, and I'm glad that when you were talking about it, I was like, 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 I was